Today's review is by popular request. A lot of fans have asked me what I thought of Ghostbusters Afterlife. This will be a spoiler review, but in short, I thought it was pretty good. It paid a lot of respects to the Ghostbusters legacy, the memory of Harold Ramis, and was all around a love letter to the fans. But before I get down to it, a word from this video sponsor. Kamikoto forges amazing quality Japanese steel kitchen knives using traditional techniques from Japan with a legacy of over 800 years dating back to the Edo period. Excellent knives. And as you can see, I have my chef uniform out for the occasion. Besides, I've always been into Japanese culture. As I've mentioned over the years, I've been slowly learning the language in my spare time. So when I heard the history of the Kamikoto knives, I gravitated towards them immediately. Kamikoto also only uses steel sourced from authentic Japanese mills, so you know you're getting a high quality product. Each knife set comes in a beautiful heavy duty ash wood box, which doubles as a storage case to keep the blades stored safely and makes it the perfect gift. Speaking of the blades, each Japanese steel knife goes through a rigorous 19 step process that takes years to complete before being individually inspected. After Kamikoto graciously sent me a set, I used them to make a few meals and came away impressed. The knives all felt really well balanced in my hands and cut like a dream. I honestly didn't realize I could cut something so precisely until I tried Kamikoto. And Kamikoto is so confident in the quality of their knives that each one comes with a lifetime guarantee. Right now, Kamikoto's Valentine's Day sale is going on, so head on over to kamikoto.com slash cinemassacre, or click the link in the description and use code cinemassacre to get $50 off your purchase on top of any other special offers. That's kamikoto.com slash cinemassacre, code cinemassacre. So I promise I'll dive into Ghostbusters Afterlife real soon, but first I want to talk about this new exciting trend that it belongs to, which I find fascinating. It's the trend of bringing back a movie series or franchise after a long break with returning cast members and passing the torch onto younger actors and a younger generation of audiences. I find this all very interesting because decades ago, this sort of nostalgia genre could not have existed, at least not the way it is now. I mean, first, the movie or franchise has to have become a beloved classic needs a lot of time to be seen by more than one generation and still be within the lifespan of the original actors. So we're living in an interesting era here. When I saw the new Ghostbusters and Cobra Kai season four back to back, I thought to myself, this is something I could discuss. This is fun. Some call them soft reboots, but I think I'd call them fresh sequels because even though they're sequels and take place in the same continuity, they're like a fresh start. There's even a new Scream movie that makes fun of this premise. It's important to give this context because this is how we can rate Ghostbusters Afterlife. How does it hold up as a nostalgic, passing the torch kind of film? And there's many creative choices that go with it. It can be like the Star Wars sequel trilogy where the focus is on new characters with the old ones taking smaller roles. You might like those movies or you might not, but whatever the case, it's a fascinating strategy to cast a wide net to catch old fans and new fans alike, while also increasing the longevity of the series. I have mixed opinions about those movies. I think it didn't work as a trilogy. Each one felt like its own separate thing. The new cast was excellent, but they needed a better script to tie the three movies together, or could have wrapped it up as one movie instead. Jurassic World is an example where it's almost like its own film. Even though it's said in the same continuity and makes references to the older films, it doesn't rely on old cast members. Slowly with each sequel, it seems they've been working them in. So I think this one fits in a weird place, especially the first Jurassic World, where they could have just cut ties and made it a straight up reboot or work in the original cast right away with the first installment, pass the torch, and then focus on the new cast. Instead, it seems like it's going the other way around. But hey, let's wait and see what part three is gonna be like. Blade Runner 2049 is another one where it's a sequel by all means, except it follows a new character, the Ryan Gosling character, and we never see Harrison Ford till much later. But when you do, it feels important. I think this was an excellent film that stands on its own and lines up perfectly within the Blade Runner universe. 
Then there's Star Trek 2009, which would have been a full reboot, except they cross timelines with the original Spock, who passes the torch onto the newer Spock. I felt the Leonard Nimoy scenes were really great, although kind of an odd way to connect it to the original universe. Overall, I didn't think the movie was as good as a lot of the praise I was hearing at the time. It was more like mainstream action rather than thought-provoking science fiction. Then there's the case where they ignore certain sequels, such as Halloween H20 and 2018, which both did the exact same thing, bring back Jamie Lee Curtis and play as a direct sequel to the original. The 2018 sequel, the one called Halloween, that's a sequel to Halloween, was a surprising choice to me because after the Rob Zombie remake and sequel that followed, I didn't expect them to go back to the old timeline. It was a little awkward and more of the same stuff, but I still appreciate the fan service and all the little references. It was kind of the same situation as Evil Dead. They made a remake, but then afterwards went back to the original timeline and brought back Bruce Campbell for a whole TV show. The show was a lot of fun and a welcome treat for all the fans. The new characters were great, and I can see them branching off into their own series. So if they wanted to pass the torch, I saw this as a possibility, if Bruce Campbell no longer returns. Another TV example was Fuller House. The focus is on a younger cast, while the old cast drops in from time to time. For those of us who remember watching Full House, it feels like a perfect continuation. The same dumb household humor. Nothing better, nothing worse. Didn't need to exist, but brought some comfort to see it back. And by the way, rest in peace, Bob Saget, who found his way in all of our hearts as the lovable dad. Cobra Kai Season 4 is another one in the realm of TV show that began as a film. In the same way as Evil Dead, there was a reboot, The Karate Kid with Jaden Smith. That was actually really good, I thought. So I don't think anyone ever expected a sequel to the original Karate Kid timeline and in the form of an entire show and for it to be really good. I really love Cobra Kai, but let's save it. I'll talk about it more next time. My favorite Passing the Torch film by far is Creed, because it truly does that. Rocky passes the torch to Adonis Creed and has fully embraced the role as mentor, just as Mickey had done for him. So with Creed 2, Michael B. Jordan now has that torch and is running with it. And we're good now to continue with or without Rocky. But in this case, with Creed 2, Rocky is still a supporting character and even a villain from his own past, Drago, returns. So it's still tightly wound within the Rocky universe. These are movies that look to the past, but with a strong pace forward. There's many more examples, but let's get to the prime review here. The one you asked for. Of all the movies and franchises that fans have been asking for a comeback, I can't think of anything bigger than Ghostbusters Afterlife. First, I want to say, if you're a big Ghostbusters fan who has not yet seen this and who knows very little about it, you're probably in a rare and special situation here. So my advice to you is stop the video now. Don't let me spoil anything. Just go see it and you'll be glad you did. Anyway, here we go. Spoilers ahead. So first of all, it takes place 30-something years after the original, and that time gap seems to have paid off because you remember in Ghostbusters 2 when everybody's basically forgotten that ghosts exist, even though it took place only five years after the original? Well, now with a larger time span, it seems a little more believable. And they haven't entirely forgotten. They make explicit references to the events of the first movie. This is a type of fresh sequel. It's in the same continuity, but its main focus is on the new cast and their own story. For literally decades, Dan Aykroyd has been talking about a movie where the old Ghostbusters pass the torch onto younger Ghostbusters. This seems to be that movie. Now, the younger Ghostbusters turned out to be very young, and it's always charming when you have child actors, especially when they do such a great job. The standout performance is McKenna Grace as Phoebe, the granddaughter of Egon Spengler. She seems to actually channel Harold Ramis, speaking in lots of technical jargon, but also with a lot of humor and deadpan jokes. With that type of script, it could have fallen flat, but she works with it really well. Paul Rudd is also very good. 
I've been pleasantly surprised to see him in so many roles, doing such a great job all the time, when I'll always remember him as the guy from Halloween 6. <laughs> He's come a long way. It was also nice to see Annie Potts make an appearance early on. It's hard to imagine the franchise without her. Jason Reitman did a great job carrying on what his father started and making sure it fit with the tone and look of the original. Now with that said, while this film does succeed in honoring the original, it does feel tonally different. The original two movies were more like these farcical comedies, while this one's a little more sentimental. It kind of takes its time and tries to be a little more dramatic. So it's a very different kind of movie. Now, it is very hard to emulate that 80s type of humor like Caddyshack and Stripes and all that. It's kind of like something you can't really repeat, but that can be a good thing. You know, for one, it's a little safer to show kids. Might be a bit scary at times, but you're not gonna be forced into explaining why a ghost is unzipping Ray's pants. <laughs> Or does anybody remember that scene in Ghostbusters 2 when they hint that Egon and Ray are performing certain tests with the slime? You're not sleeping with it, are you, Ray? The special effects are a solid return to form. I didn't even know going into it how much of a trip down memory lane it was going to be seeing the terror dogs in full animatronic glory. Wow, does it look good. I'm pretty sure when they're running, it's CG, but it looks great. And honestly, we all have to admit, it looks better than the running shots in the original. The little Stay Puffs were pretty cute too. Kind of an unexpected, but welcome idea. We saw Stay Puff Giant before, now let's see him small. I didn't expect Gozer to be the main villain again, nor could I have expected how much of a blast from the past it was gonna be. As soon as I heard Gozer speak, I was like, wow. I remember that voice. It was just like in Revenge of the Sith when the Emperor first started looking and speaking the way he did before, and it blew my mind and brought me back to Return of the Jedi, when he wasn't the character I was expecting to get excited about. Also, the sound effect of the proton pack charging and firing was just amazing. It triggers part of your brain and takes you back. But for the purpose of our topic here, the part of this movie that we need to talk about is the last 10 minutes, when the original Ghostbusters finally show up. I have to admit, I was getting pretty antsy and wondering if they were going to show up at all, but when they did, the feeling of nostalgia was euphoric. It's an easy win. Just to see them standing there in their suits, their presence alone is worthy of an applause. Never mind that the Ghostbusters have never found a way to make smaller proton packs in over 30 years, or why they wear the same suits. It doesn't matter. Nostalgia... <laughs> Nostalgia overrides all logic. And their dialogue and personalities are up to par, just like we didn't miss any time at all. I mean, that chemistry between them, that witty dialogue, is what made the Ghostbusters so endearing in the first place. Then Egun shows up as a ghost, which I had the feeling was gonna happen, just as Peter remarks. And it's funny to think, all these decades, we thought Peter Venkman was going to be the ghost because of Bill Murray's longtime reluctance. But now, that seems like it's all behind. Now, the topic of using CG to bring deceased actors back can be a debatable tactic. Sometimes it works, other times it doesn't. In Star Wars Rogue One, I thought the first time you see Peter Cushing, it was amazing, but then he gets way too much screen time and it starts to get a little awkward. Here with Egon, I think they made the clever choice for him not to speak. It never overstays its welcome. Some have said it was disrespectful to Harold Ramis. I don't agree with that because that was clearly not the intent. And the depiction is of the character Egon, not Harold Ramis the person. And from what I heard, that's what his daughter said too. So, family should approve, yes. So I think it was a great send-off to the character, as well as a touching tribute to Ramis. I do have mixed feelings about the way the original Ghostbusters were worked into the plot. It felt like an extended cameo. On one hand, it was a great idea to show that the movie can stand on its own ground before bringing in the old cast, but it didn't have to be so late and so abrupt. Earlier, we see Ray, but it's through a phone call, which is never as dynamic, and then he tells us what the other Ghostbusters have been up to. 
but rather than telling us, it would have been nice to actually see them. I thought they'd each get their own individual scenes and then build up to the big reunion. Maybe there wasn't room for all that, but it seemed there could have been a subplot about getting the band back together, kind of like the Blues Brothers, which of course had Dan Aykroyd. It just felt like there was another story in there that was crying to get out. But there actually was a Bill Murray scene with Sigourney Weaver, but it was tacked on at the end. And then after the credits, we got an Ernie Hudson scene with Annie Potts. It's my feeling that these type of scenes could have existed somewhere inside the actual movie. Now, like I said, these are mixed feelings because on the other hand, the Ghostbusters showing up abruptly has a strong surprise element. If you didn't know they were going to be in this movie, or only suspected, then wow, it'll have you jumping out of your seat. So ultimately, it may not be the most evenly paced passing of the torch film, but it does stand on its own ground, and the fan service is very much appreciated. On that note, let me know what are your favorite passing the torch films. I'll catch you next time.